This is the hour. Where are you living? What are you doing? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. Do not look outside yourself for the leader. There is a river so great and swift that some will fear they're being torn apart and suffer greatly. The river has its destination. Let go from the shore, push into the middle, see who is in there with you, and celebrate. So in addition to all of you in there with me in this work, um, two of my beloved colleagues and friends, Kristen Hull and Joel Solomon, I'll give you a longer introduction to them. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to you to hear a little bit about why, what drew you to this session, and then go back to them and then have a conversation. So, but first, how did I come to this work? I was born into what's an unusual relationship in the general public um, with money as an inheritor of a fortune made over a hundred years ago by my great-grandfather. It wasn't big enough to support me for the rest of my life, but it was big enough for me to start asking questions about the connection of money and meaning as a young adult. And I luckily found a community who was involved in grappling with the questions, the Threshold Foundation community. It's a national network of social change philanthropists. And out of that grew this work that I'm now engaged in with uh, investor philanthropist Carol Newell of Vancouver. I've been convening conferences under the name Play Big for seven years. And Play Big is a uh, convening that's designed for people who have tens of millions of dollars extra and are looking to illuminate the path forward for them toward whole, what we call whole portfolio activation to mission. We partner now with RSF Social Finance, Tides, and Tides Canada. And um, through that work, I've heard lots of stories over these seven years. I know that people want to align their money with their values but they often don't know how to, as the prayer I opened with says, push away from the banks of the river. So Play Big is about peers helping peers. It's about subverting the dominant paradigm about money, and it's about the liberation of money and the liberation of people. One little quote I'll tell you, I was talking recently to a woman who had attended our Play Big uh, last spring, and she said, I was never, she, she's steward of tens of millions of dollars, she said, I was never interested in investment until I came to Play Big and realized that meaning could be a part of it. So, and as Catherine Fulton said this morning in her opening remarks, we're at a time between times and we need pioneers. And I have two pioneers uh, with me, uh, Joel Solomon and Kristen Hall. And I, they gave me permission this morning to tell a little bit about their stories. And in fact, I'm going to go sit with them, because then I can feel into it. So um, I met Joel through Threshold Foundation decades ago, and for 20 years, he and his business partner have been um, putting $60 million to work in all the creative ways they could think of. In, with a regional focus, their mission was to support a sustainable economy in the region of British Columbia. And Joel has the unusual ability to be in the implementing um, mechanics and and at the same time hold the value of relationships and meaning, and he's really good at going back and forth. So I'm going to, um, I'm excited to hear how he'll talk to you guys. In the meantime, more recently, I um, met Kristen through, she came to play big, and she just, about 
five years ago, got it that she could had the opportunity to put $20 million, transform the portfolio of her family foundation. And she, for some reason, her character, she didn't hesitate. She was just like, well, why can't we do that? And actually, this morning, they told, they ref referred to Root Capital and how they were interested now in invest, uh, gender investment, gender lens investing. Why was that? Because Kristen asked the question. So um, that's the beginning of her introduction. So let's see what else. So I'm going to start with a question for you guys and then find out why these people came to the session. How would you say, and Joel, I'll start with you, that, that invocation that I started with, how would you say that your work with whole portfolio activation is a response to that invitation? Well, obviously, some starts with my family. And uh, growing up in the South, uh, as a Jew in the South of a uh, civically involved and relatively progressive family in the 60s, 50s and 60s, um, I got exposed to things that activated my sense of justice and fairness. And I, my father was a very successful businessman. And he built shopping malls. And I had a lot of questions about what it meant to pave paradise and put up parking lots and things like that. And the 60s, uh, if any of you weren't there, was a time of questioning everything for at least those who got uh, infected by it. And that included me. Uh, and I thought a lot about my own lineage and how my family had immigrated to a new country and why. And the context that I found myself in and civil rights issues were, were uh, very up at the time. And there was a moment sitting home watching television of the 1968 Democratic Convention with the uh, police riots going on outside and the whole world watching in which I, something happened to me at that moment of realizing that I didn't have to accept things as they were and that there was a way to do something about it. So fast forward a little bit, um, after getting involved in Threshold Foundation and getting exposed to a community of support of people who at least shared values that might be unconventional, but there was a critical mass of that sharing values to support each other. And so I got exposed to all kinds of different methods of thinking about money and philanthropy and how to live life. Um, I met Carol Newell and had the opportunity to, uh, in, incredible privilege to come and, and w see if we could invent a way to work with <clears throat> a large amount of capital. She felt that the majority of her wealth should be dedicated to long-term sustainability and social change. And we went and did a retreat for several days. Uh, one of the people that we invited is Drummond Pike, who's sitting up here in the front, who had been the founder of Tides Foundation. So people like Drummond and lots of others who were pioneers and, a, and ahead of us were stimulating and supporting us to think in new ways. And it was, around, it was just after 1992, and we were celebrating the great discovery of Christopher Columbus of North America. And so considering what that meant and what Euro-Asian immigration and colonialism had meant to this continent, I'll just leave that as shorthand, uh, caused me to decide, and for Carol to decide, that it was important to do what we could now, <clears throat> those of us living at the peak of human ingenuity and technological advance, industrial advance, but where was wisdom and where were the values of being land-based peoples ultimately? And how could we work in the modern context while carrying deep values? And so that began a pathway of looking at money and all of its aspects and just on a, a kind of common sense, maybe moralistic basis, how could we reclaim every way that money, 
that we had responsibility for, how we shop, where we shop, who we buy from, how our products are made, what are the externalities or the impacts of, of the creation of those on people on the planet uh, and on uh, the biosphere of the planet. And so we made a commitment together to look at the entire portfolio of Carol's money. I did this myself as well. Uh, and how could we awaken and activate its potential towards positive good? Was it in a credit union? Was it in a bank? Do we do stock market? If we do, what kind of screens do we put on it? And the field was just emerging, uh, at, at, or was in an earlier stage of emerging at that time. And, and we saw that there was an opportunity to work in our region and find good ideas uh, coming to networks like this and then go invest in them in a small scale way where we lived. And I have lots more to say about it, but I think I've taken enough time on that answer. Great, thanks. And Kristen, how would you say that your work is a response to that call? So um, similarly, I think it starts with my personal story and I was working as a bilingual teacher in Oakland for many years while also um, working with my family's company. And um, when it came time to sell that company, we for the first time had much more money than we ever needed. And so I was already doing this work that was pretty significant and meaningful to me and then all of a sudden had this extra. And for a while, I pushed it away. I didn't really want to be associated with it. And then um, through going to the Threshold Foundation and then learning through Play Big, I found out that this actually could be more of a tool for the work that I was already doing and that I just needed to learn how to activate it towards some of my core issues, which are social justice and environmental sustainability. And so that's what I did. And I kind of set out, and I think part of the poem or the prayer that you said really spoke to me is really being grounded in my surroundings, um, really keeping my foot on the ground about what is going on around me. Also, particularly with our earth, um, the rivers and the trees and all of those things, and keeping that as part of my investing work has been pretty important to me. Um, and then, who do you want to be with about the river? I think surrounding myself with the support in the community that um, I want to do this work with has been so um, invigorating, inspiring. I've learned so much so far, and I'm just beginning this work. So I think all of it speaks to me on some level. Well, and I would say also the part about don't look outside yourself for leader, because I've seen you really step into leadership. And, and both Joel and Kristen, I think, value um, having their work be transparent, because, and of course, Play Big is about that too. How do we find our way forward? But by, you know, in order to be it, we have to see it. So I'd love to hear from a few of you about um, what drew you to this session, just so we can make sure that we respond. Is Bjorn there with the mic? Um, just love to hear a little popcorn about what interests you about um, this content, so that we can make sure to respond. Anybody ha want to just share what brought you to? this session. There's one over there. Good morning. Um, my name's James Perry from Panapur. Uh, we're a foundation in the UK who are deploying uh, our assets into impact investments. Um, I'm really interested in the question of return and whether or not you think it's possible to make a deployment um, of 100% of your assets without experiencing attrition on capital. Thank you. Others who um, want to share what drew them to this session over there on the aisle? Thanks, Bjorn. Josh Arno, Arno Family Fund. Uh, interested in the answer to the same question. Um, very interested in all of these issues, but the, the investing world Aligning the mission and the values with the actual investments, given the mainstream approach that dominates, um, seems like an almost insurmountable hurdle. So I'm interested in 
uh, how you actually, the mechanics of what you're doing, how you're doing it, what the return profiles are, what the portfolio actually looks like. How long did it take you to achieve uh, moving, you know, the wholesale transformation of the portfolio? Does that take 10 years? Did it take six months? Et cetera. Thank you, Josh. Anybody else before we, one more over there. Yeah, right? Hi, Sean Paul, People and Planet Holdings, and Kristen's example. I'm interested in the, like MRI, PRI, and grants. How are you putting that together? Do you is it all aligned? Or are they separate? And certainly, in Joel's experience, while there isn't the U.S. legal structure, what's the vision and strategy to use those different uh, tools and strategies for in investing? Great. Well, that feeds right into my next question, which is. And if you can integrate some answers to those questions in that, well, how did you do this whole portfolio activation? Do you want to start this time, Kristen? Um, sure, happy to start. Um, so when I'm working through these processes and how I'm going to talk to people about them, I draw things out. So I'll share with you a couple of things I've drawn out. Um, it's the teacher in her. It is. It's the classroom. I've left the classroom, but I've brought it with me. Um, the first time I attended a Play Big session, I actually spoke with Drummond and Joel, and I said, okay, sign me up, I'm in, I get it, I wanna do this, what can I do, and how much does it cost? And I wanted a menu. I wanted them to say, you know, if you put in $3 million here, you can, you know, um, clothe, you know, 17 million children, buy this many school books, have this many solar homes. Like, I wanted kind of an idea, I wanted to know how to change the Congress, and could I, my money do that? Like, I wanted specifics. And they both looked at me and they said, well, no, Kristen, that's not how you do it. And that's not what it's about. And you come up and you, and, and anyway, so just to say that there is no menu and you really get to decide and you really get to do what you're drawn to and called to. Um, at the same time, I am hoping to help change the field so that it gets more, um, I think specific, so people that want to get in at a menu level can just check off their boxes and can sign up. So that's kind of my, um, my thought at this time. Um, and then the other one that feels important right now is the, how did I get started? And this is continually my process, but I kind of think about the money as far as my values. And I have this bullseye here, and where what I'd love to do is see all of my assets, my energies, my monies, my actions in the world aligned with my core values. So if we decided that's what my core values were, um, gender equity, racial equity, social justice, environmental sustainability, however you define your values, and then just figuring out where are you and where is your money, where is your time, where are your efforts. And so I just start looking at this and um, as we talked about this morning, it involved opening up a lot of envelopes. I think a lot of us don't really look at our financial statements and we're not really sure what that means. But I th So opening the envelopes, really figuring out where is your money, that's the first step and that's what I did. And inevitably you'll find out, oh, that's not actually so bad, I don't mind where this one is, but this is way far outside of my target area, so I want to work on moving that first. So I put um, a lot of things into community banks, um, and I actually pulled things right out of the public markets. I wasn't happy with where my money was there, so I put things in community banks that were doing financial literacies, um, all sorts of classes for new immigrants in my area of Oakland, and I was excited about that. Um, I've used One Pacific Bank. I also um, have been really thrilled with um, RSF. They've been really helpful about being a place that I could park money for a while. And so anyway, using those kinds of vehicles, um, then gradually moving money to other kinds of deals as they come up. So, Great. Okay. Good start. We're taking, on, we're taking on a super complicated thing, which is a financial system that's been well designed and well built uh, or, or deeply uh, constructed over some years. And all of us have got a risk and return ratio need. Individuals, institutions, families. So there's personal work or, or reflective work that needs to be done, whether you're institution or individual, 
about what that really means to you. you and, and where do you want to be on it? Are, you can go maximum financial return with no attention to the consequences of that to other people. So that's one end of the spectrum. Another end is I'm going to give all my money away to people that I think will do good things with it. And you could call that minus 100% return versus maximum return, though you often get tax breaks, so it's not quite minus 100. There's a huge zone in between. And, and how far into that zone does, does one go is a deeper, uh, perhaps spiritual question, uh, psychological question, practical question, how much of this money is needed by whom. And so you have to respect all ends of, of, of the spectrum. And we heard today that there's a massive movement of billions of dollars coming this way. And some of that will be, some of us will think it's not really changing much. And then some of the people that have responsibility for billions of dollars are going to look at those of us who might be more risk-taking pioneers and say, well, you can do that because you're special. And we can't really do that. We're taking care of people's pensions and, and retirement funds. I, I'm a big tent on this. I don't think change to this complex and entrenched of a system comes easily. So there's a need for pioneers, and there's a need for pioneers in, in any kind of change. So, you know, we, we live over in the uh, more pioneer zone because we can. And we need people who can to make that choice as much as they can. So if you have a family foundation, uh, it depends on how many trustees and how many family members and how uh, who your financial advisors are and how uh, locked down your assets are. You give away some money, undoubtedly. You do some kind things with money, undoubtedly. Well, do you want to make a difference in how the world works, with how money works in the world, the way RSF uh, social finance uh, themes their work? Uh, or are you looking for how I can do something that is more constructive, pays attention to some of the externalities, and still makes a return rate that I feel is respectable for what I need to do. I could point out that return rates and reliability of return rates are unmasking themselves a bit right now. It's, it's not so clear who has the ability to consistently pull off what return rates. We know there's a lot of gaming that goes on in return rate analysis and what date did it start and how are you counting it. But we've all got our philosophical and our pragmatic aspect of where we fit in, in, that, uh, in that spectrum. So we're here talking as uh, pioneers who want to enco encourage others to take the risks that they can take so that things can be invented and tested and experimented with and then bigger, smarter players may come in and commoditize it more effectively, and then that will be success. We, we need both radical action to demonstrate what can be, and incremental change, reformist change of capitalism, so that it's kinder and gentler and uh, thinks about the long-term future and thinks about everyone a bit more than just the individual. And Joel, I know one of the ways that you talk about your work with Carol and Renewal is that you knew you couldn't transform the world yourselves, but you could create stories. stories. And stories would be told and they would ripple out. Do you want to share a story or two that embodies what you were trying to do? Or, ha you know? Okay. Were well, I would just say I'm incredibly gratified as someone who's gray enough now to have been doing this for some decades that what was, I, I think of it like uh, organic food in the 50s. This is organic money. And there's probably 50 years to go before there's an industry that, like organic food, takes up still under 10% of the North American food dollar, but yet is a robust sector that makes money for people. And you can go into it and do scale if you want to, or you can go further down into grassroots and you can do that. So our, our first thought was food was the best place for us to start. And why? Because everybody uses it. And because it has so many uh, ramifications, how food is grown, how workers end up being affected by how food is grown, what happens to rivers, what happens to the 
where do those chemicals go and do they end up in the cancer rate or not and can that be proven or not? So our first, our first approach was we want to use our for-profit dollars, our charitable dollars, our convening power, our ability to support leaders and to create capacity to develop the entrepreneurs uh, uh, who, who might lead this field. The same way this morning we saw there's an explosion right now of incubators and accelerators going on that's very exciting because an industry is being created. So around food, we said, we didn't really think, we didn't figure out how we could invest in farms. We didn't want to be involved in, in foreclosing on someone's farm. That just, that, that wasn't good for us. But we could be involved in manufacturing, distribution, uh, retailing, and uh, activism around uh, issues of, of organics. And we could create, help create community and, and bring resources to people that were giving their lives to this. So the first thing I did, I, I had known a, a guy from earlier years when I lived up in the uh, British Columbia Islands who had started a natural foods and organic store early, early, early. And, and, and by the time I got into the business with Carol, he had opened a store in Vancouver and was about to open his second store, which was a huge thing that there was gonna be an organic food store to have two locations. Uh, this is uh, early 90s, in, and so in Vancouver, that's, that's how it was. Well, they had started construction on their new store without having all the capital put together. They just went on passion and uh, belief. And Ernst and & Young, who, was the, who were the accounting firm for Carol Newell, came to us with a deal that turned out to be Russell Precious and Capers uh, Food Stores, who was the hippie that I knew uh, 15 years earlier, who used to drive all the way across British Columbia to the Okanagan, the fruit growing region of, of BC, buy organic peaches and come back and sell them on the side of the road out of his truck uh, on these little islands. And now here he was showing up with a multi-million dollar uh, organic food store that was, that, so relationship based, understanding, believing in the integrity of, of the person and their true beliefs. Uh, some financial credibility coming from Ernst & Young who was willing to pass this thing along. And I had a mandate to get some money out the door into things that mattered in food systems. Well, I go meet with them. It turns out they're, they're, they all can't pay the construction bills. Uh, and the mandate was pretty risk tolerant. So we made a commitment to, to Capers. Uh, it was successful. Uh, it later got sold to Wild Oats, which got sold, I mean, to Alfalfas, which got sold to Wild Oats, which got sold to Whole Foods. And you can have your viewpoints about all of that politics, and that's now the next thing we can all work on if we care about it. But at the time, uh, just seeing that, that, that organic food and local food, which was their commitment, could be available to consumers in Vancouver meant a cascade effect of many businesses and many farmers and many, you know, the, the whole industry would be supported because retail was kind of the end, the end of the chain. And uh, because I took a lot of time on that story, I'll just leave that one. Great, well, we'll get to hear more. So we made, we made good money on that deal. The return rate, we uh, tripled our money fairly shortly. Wow. So Kristen, one of the things I know that you're doing now in your role, it's sort of, um, you've merged your educator and your whole portfolio activist selves. And so you're talking to a lot of different people who are trying to you know, work their way towards doing, working with the money in a different way. Given the questions that come to you or the obstacles that you perceive, do you have a story from your work that is an answer to that? In other words, you, you met with your own obstacles and um, you, I'd, I'd just like to hear one of your stories that is inspiring to others who may be feeling some um, intimidation. Sure, sure. Um, I think our dominant paradigm is our biggest obstacle. I think that 
things have been done a certain way. We know this, you know, about our financial ins institutions and the way people have done investing, the way people have thought about money and what interest are you making. Um, so I think that's my biggest obstacle is trying to be a little bit different and move in those waters with a different lens or way of being. So um, when people say, how much are you making, I really try to think about one, well, one, let me back up just to say I'm almost even having a problem with the word impact investing these days and just wanting it to be more about conscious investing and so that we're really um, aware, we're bringing our presence, our heart to what we're doing. Um, I, we can problematize maybe over lunch what impact means and who's receiving the impact and you know all of that. Um, but then as far as doing the actual work, bringing that lens or way of being to our dominant paradigm has been tricky um, and I think it takes a little bit of resilience because when I want to know what I'm getting back as we all do in an investment um, and I'm not going to measure that just on dollar sign I want to know again you know um, have I been able to move the dial as far as how many people get you know wind power solar power um, how many people have more access to this kind of schooling or that. So though I'm asking all sorts of questions and I want it to be a multi-dimensional thing and so getting people to come along with me there has been more difficult. Um, some of the things though are not that difficult at all and it's just asking the questions and just bringing your values to the table has been easy. So for example, the root capital that, we, that was spoken about this morning, um, we were brought a deal that was a mid-level, um, not the microfinance, but for people that already had businesses in the developing world, and this was gonna help them get, you know, 10 more sewing machines or a plant or roofs over there, you know, and, and I, great, this is great. This market didn't seem to be tapped. The return was, you know, fine looking at that, and we just said, well, how many women um, will receive this and benefit from this, and they didn't know the answer, but it wasn't too many conversations later or too many questions where we said, hey, this is what we really want. We want a fund for women. And they were willing to work with us and then built that product that's now available. Um, and what's kind of fantastic is that other foundations, individuals are getting involved in the women's initiative through Root Capital, but also it just happened to be at the time when the Gates Foundation was looking to study women entrepreneurs, and so they're doing that now this year, and I think that may lend a stamp of approval that will make it even that much better. So, and it just started with a conversation saying, I'm interested in knowing about how this is affecting women. And so I have several of those that just asking the question, is this green, is it organic, who does it serve, who will be employed here? It's expanding the due diligence process with your values, basically, is what I hear in that. And we've, um, you know, I've talked to so many different people, and it feels like so often people think they are not expert enough. And that's part of what you were talking about, Joel, of the system, and that oh, there's a language there, and it's science, and as Joel likes to call it, the priesthood has kept it opaque. Um, so, love to turn it over uh, to you all at this moment with Bjorn at the microphone, and there's a question in the back. So, a, a, a few, we'll do a few questions for the panel here. Yep, in the back, great. Thank you. I'm Rosalie Cates, hi Joel. Thank both of you for your heartfelt remarks. There's, you, you, they're good remarks and they've been made in such a lovely way, so thank you. My question is maybe kind of boring because it's in the old paradigm, but it's so neat to hear about the kind of one-off equity deals, you know, into a business and, you know, those are just, they get your juices running. But when you think of your whole portfolio, that's what attracted me to your topic. What's the asset allocation? How much are those really cool really fun things, and then do you have a bunch of boring stuff that's doing other things? Is that enough? Oh, I have to pull this one out for them. <laughs> so Kristen, sounds like you've got a response to that one, for starters. So, how is your pie working for you? What has it done for you lately? And how delicious is it? So, I have also, I grew up in a, not only was I a school teacher for many years, but I had um, a father who's a mathematician and you know started businesses that we were then involved with so I've grown up with pie charts in my head about asset allocations and moving it this much we have to get into foreign markets um, you know um, 
you know, this much debt, this much real estate. Um, and I'm really shifting that now. I think that the crash or the recent, you know, ways the market has gone, you know, 2007, 2008, I think has us all questioning where our assets are. And so I'm really looking for solid investments. And my thinking about this is changing a lot as my learning curve is huge. Um, first, I wanted to be completely out of public markets because um, it didn't match my values as and I wasn't sure that's where I wanted things to be. Now I'm looking at re-entering but using my values and I'm working with Amy Dominey to build um, a portfolio of solutions-oriented companies and so that's kind of my next step about doing this. Um, but as far as 20%, 50%, 36%, it's all very rich and delicious is what I can say. Well, I can talk about this in a lot of different ways. One, one would be to say, what did, what did we do with Carol Newell's portfolio? And first, there's an assessment of what needed, what did she feel, and with support from advisors, she needed to protect to be sure that she would have, through her lifetime, what she wanted and needed. And then, on the other side, how much social change, high-risk things would we do, and how much would be charity, and how much would be business. And then, within each of those, but particularly on the business side, how much is small seed capital going into highly innovative things that you might have only used your charitable money for, and how much would we invest in things that could prove a reasonable return rate so that somebody else might do this. Uh, and that led to the formation of Renewal Partners, which, which was our investment fund. That was, we called it professional angel money. Uh, we, it was the biggest, we, uh, biggest kind of deal was usually 250000 and, and uh, a lot of them were much smaller than that. That led to, a uh, decade later, uh, going into the fund management business, and we've now created Renewal 2, that uh, Renewal 2 fund, which is a $35 million fund that, that brought, has brought in money from 16 charitable foundations and a lot of dozens and dozens of families in Canada, the U.S., and Europe. And we have, uh, per, we have put forth a 15% annualized return rate, and we think we're doing, we think we're on track for that. It's early, we're just a couple of years into it, we'll see. Um, on the other hand, in our portfolio, we think about, I also do uh, work as an entrepreneur in residence at RSF Social Finance. And RSF has a product which is available to people with $1,000 that is a 90-day deposit or hold in which the money is then loaned out to lots of organic food companies, Waldorf schools, other educational and green businesses that are considered part of the transformation. But they have a good sized reserve and they've never lost anyone's money over 25 years. And we're earning uh, three quarters of a percent on a, on a 90 day note. So there are a lot of instruments now out there that cover the full spectrum and you have to, Rosalie, just sit down like it, 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 each individual, each entity has to figure out its risk return ratio and does it, does it have a reason? I mean, I, I want to ask it that way. Does it have a reason to want to grow? Does it need to grow? Okay, if the answer to that is yes, then you're going to lean. Uh, you, you still can just choose where to put your cash, what kind of institution. You can still choose where to, where to do CDs and short-term money. And you can do, there's now, you can invest in land conservancy that's relatively stable. You can do affordable housing that can be relatively stable. And so it's, it's just a matter for each portfolio. I urge, look at your underlying values and your meaning and purpose in life. What's, what's really the goal? Um, and once the, that kind of work is done, then you meet your requirements of uh, income and return, and you hope you succeed at it. So what I hear from both of you then is you liberated yourselves from a conventional way of looking at um, sectors and you know the pie chart. But, but I will say that with the part of Carol's money that needed to be long-term and stable or growing to a degree, we went to a money manager and said, Here's how many tens of millions of dollars we want you to take care of. And we, we basically said, we, we're going to, you know, we, we want to hear your portfolio theory, as, as it were. And uh, we have a bigger portfolio theory, but for this portion of money, we're going to trust you. We want it to be screened 
stock. What's that? We don't know. That's we can't do that. And and it turned out in Canada at the time, no one had gone through studying the entire stock market to even put standards on, uh, so that you could judge companies in that way: best of sector, worst of least worst of sector. So we tracked down a guy named Michael Jancy, who we heard was doing this work, and he was out of money and halfway through the Toronto Stock Exchange, so he could at least have basic research on each company. And so we ended up investing and becoming his financial partner to help him build that industry in, in Canada. He remains one of the only independents in the world. Triados and some other folks in Europe have invested. It's now Jancy Sustainalytics that's global, but one of the last independents in, uh, in uh, researching the stock, stock exchange. And we also took our money managers down to the U.S. To, it happened to be at the time people, uh, Joyce Habusha at Rockefeller, uh, uh, to say, this is credible, money manager to money manager. It can be done. It's, here's where it's happening. And they had to be one of the first in Canada, and they wouldn't tell customers about it in the beginning because they, didn't, they thought it would hurt their credibility. And then gradually one customer, one client after another, and now they're one of the leading um, SRI uh, investment houses in the country. That is a big obstacle I've observed a lot, it has to do with people come and they say, oh, but I really like my advisor, and they don't really know, and I want to be loyal, so there is that. And then Kristen, um, you've modeled with the advisors the asking the questions and making them work for you, the client, to find you what you need. Right, and sometimes bringing the advisor along um, has been a strategy. I'm still kind of in that mix of, um, I think, wanting to do this, wanting to get advice, um, and yet is the, I, the, the right advice is definitely there, but it may not be in the traditional money houses where we would traditionally go for that advice. Other questions from the house? In the third row, then the first row. So thank you so much. Um, I liked your comments at the beginning about all the opportunities across the whole spectrum of risk. But one of the worries I have a little bit um, about the impact investment field, I think expanding all the different opportunities and the different risk and return ratios is a wonderful thing. But at the very, I don't know whether to say, at the very left side, let's say the minus $100 side, maybe some um, tax benefit side, I worry a little bit because I think that there's a very small group of individuals that can really free up the totally no return. I don't always think that it's not a business approach. I think you often get a huge, um, well, I think you can get enormous social impact from philanthropy as well, especially if there's a business approach. I mean, to give it, to give an example, um, we're planning on launching um, a challenge fund. I head up a network that has 43 financial institutions which have committed to scaling up small business finance for entrepreneurs. And we're trying now to really, when we work to strengthen them to service this market, we really want a gender focus. As philanthropy? Are you as, as philanthropy. So the kind of funding that we would raise for it, wherever we raise it from, is never going to give anybody um, a return. But it should have tremendous impact, and those institutions will be sustainable, making money, huge development impact once the concept is proven. And I, I just think that there's so much excitement with um, earning returns that, even, that it's maybe shrinking the pool of grant money that's actually available for philanthropy to build on the plenary speaker this morning. So expanding is great, but I worry about the shrinking as well, and I'd love to know your view on that. Well, well I think of charitable dollars as a tax structure. It's, it's, it's just a structure. Uh, if you're willing to take a tax break and you consider that's justifiable, then take a business deduction it, and, and take risk on the business side as well, <coughs> is how I look at it. So I'm all for uh, more philanthropy and more philanthropy getting into venture philanthropy as long as it doesn't so over quantify and metricize the charitable sector that it kills off policy change and deeper systemic change kinds of funding that needs to happen. If all we're doing is doing our business innovation through charity, well, better that than nothing. And, and 
And I, and, I, and I couldn't agree with you more that it is the affluent who can do this. That happens to be a lot of people and a huge amount of money. We somehow created a society where it's okay to have infinite money and it's okay to kill off tax system and, and beat back government and let the commons be dealt with by the private sector. I, you know, it's worth thinking about. Um, Tamsin. Kristen, what I was so impressed by with your, from your story is that you did a 100% impact portfolio in one year. And it's a, a, whatever you want to call it, and it's a work in progress. Joel, I just want to acknowledge you as one of the icons in the field and your story, and everybody may not know how brilliant Marion is at coaching people. I didn't hear that. She said, you're brilliant. You're brilliant. You're brilliant. Oh, I'm brilliant. brilliant. Excellent comment. <laughs> at coaching people, at getting where they want to go. Drummond? You both told some interesting stories about your successes. Um, tell me a story, each of you, about a failure and what you learned from it. Um, I'm experiencing my first failure. Um, and I've been telling people so far, well, I'm too new to know what failure is, so I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing until I have one, and then I'll course correct. And um, we were invested in a solar company in Anderson, California, um, and the management wasn't the team that we thought, and it didn't go as well as we thought, and it turned out that um, we were going to lose our entire investment unless we doubled down. So that was a big discussion. We decided, okay, we're going to double down. We're going to do this. Um, we thought we'd encourage other investors to come on board, um, and it, that wasn't the case. Um, anyway, several months, we've, I've been working on this all summer. I now own a solar plant in Northern California. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so I can't call it a failure yet, but I'm telling you I know almost nothing little to nothing about running a solar plant. So I, we're, we're getting close to the failure. And at the same time, I'm learning so much. And the process is so been amazing. I think it's part of my journey right now. So, um, but talk to me in a few months. Either pg and &E is we're going to get this contract, and all of these amazing people are going to get this solar at a really reduced cost. And it'll be thrilling. And we're employing all these people. So there's lots of wins so far. And, um, and the jury is out. And, I'll let you know. Uh, when you go into direct investing, uh, to, to quote a, a good friend, David Berg, the one thing you know about business plans is they won't happen that way. And uh, I, I'd say the, the, bi the biggest financial, well, there, oh, I just thought of a bigger one. Mm. <laughs> we got caught in the real estate crunch in 2007, but that's not the, the better story is about, uh, we, we wanted to go into independent media, great theory, uh, media is getting, uh, uh, you know, corporatized and we're not getting real information. So we invested in small magazines because that's what we could do at our scale. So uh, not only did we lose money on most of all of those, uh, but we eventually, in order to, we, we got into the local uh, holistic living magazine in Vancouver because it was an opportunity to have some media and to be able to put forth stories about all the things we're talking about here. Uh, but the financial model wasn't good enough. It gradually got rolled into an attempt to roll up these kinds of magazines across the continent. And a million dollars later, uh, that business basically failed. And the conclusion and what I learned, well, number one, kind of a meaningless learning, which is some things work and some things don't. Uh, you, you, you take your, you, when you decide to, be, to take risk, you take risk. But a better learning was, oh, the internet. I have to add on a little bit. The um, saying what you were saying made me think about that. I definitely think about, you know, is this the right amount of money to put towards this thing? And if I get this out of it, this out of it, or nothing out of it, how will I feel at the end? So I kind of take myself through an attunement process about the investing. Um, but the reason I wanted to share that is because I think that I started this work um, as a grant maker 
and with my 5% of the foundation, and we were just giving money away that we were never gonna see again. And so now that I've realized we have this 95% of the endowment that are also tools as far as MRI and PRI and all of those things, um, and asking all of these due diligence questions that we weren't necessarily asking on the grant making, I'm just thinking that once foundations in particular get involved in this kind of conscious investing, I think it's going to really make an impact on how we do our grant making. Because um, for me at least, I'm noticing the shift about, well, is that the right tool? Is this grant the right tool? Could it be better used as a PRI? Is there some kind of a business that is doing this same thing? Will it be more effective? Or outside of the foundation world, do I really need to make a political contribution because none of this is going to happen with my C3 dollars? So. The failures, I'm not even going to call them failures, my experiences are definitely affecting my learning path as I move through this. And I, one of the things I'm hearing as b both of you tell your stories is what we're trying to do with Play Big and, and at SOCAP really is talk about this continuum and you use the word tool and Joel calling philanthropy just a tax structure because so often people go philanthropy over there, investment over there and what I've learned so much uh, originally from your work Joel is what are the different creative ways that will best address which problem and to erase the bright line and its blended value and also that you get to decide for yourself. I mean, that is another thing about being a pioneer and about the dominant paradigm is not believing in it. And are you a social change agent? You better pay attention to politics. Are you a money manager that wants to meet this field and do it effectively? Those are both uh, viable and uh, noble occupations. And I was just thinking on a personal note, and then I'm going to turn it over to you two for some closing. I have a closing question. But this, this great grandfather of mine that made quadrillions of dollars in the early 1900s um, affected my life in a huge way. And then my father was an Episcopal activist bishop who thought that I told him I was going to the Social Venture Network, and he said, what's that? And I said, well, it's business people who are wanting to do good in the, by doing business. And he went, oh, yeah, right. I mean, he just de denied entirely the possibility because he had turned his back. And so I see karmically my integration of you know, these two strands as embodied by the work that you are doing and what we're trying to provide an environment for the growth of with Play Big. The sacred and the profane. <laughs> um, so my uh, final question for each of you is, as you move forward, what is your, um, what are you, what is your next thing that you're trying to do? What is your next sort of, uh, as this field evolves, what are you leaning towards or hoping to? manifest. Okay, I'll go. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of at a 1.0. I've kind of achieved that level and that I'm moving quickly to 2.0 and then maybe 4 point version in the next few years. And so um, my instincts were at first to get completely out of public markets. And in 2008, that was a great decision. So um, that actually gave me more um, money to be conscious about. Um, and learn with, and so I think that, well, one thing also, I started with fixed income, and that was a great way for me to learn about one asset class, kind of, and all the different kind of ways that that happened, and now I'm expanding out of that into these other things. Um, so, um, I think as my thinking goes forward, I'm now thinking more about the public markets and really wanting to make this um, accessible to many, many people. So I'm looking at different investments that would um, make the investment level, say, $25. Um, Solar Mosaic is one of those opportunities, and I'm looking at um, another that's called Ethical Electric, um, which will, um, I, I think, make it make this field, I guess, flatter so that more people can get involved. The so that's... Democratization. Of, thank you. I think Don's leading a session on that later this week, in fact. Excellent. So yeah, I'm looking for all of those opportunities and expanding those. So that's what I'm excited about. Joel? Well, I was born to privilege, 
And I got more privilege by uh, being invited to work with Carol Newell. And I've now had a direct hand in placing over $100 million in one way or another. And my role at this point as I'm earning my eldership is to, do, to devote the rest of my life to do everything I can to leverage billions of dollars and maybe trillions, maybe we have to talk trillions these days to make a dent, but to, lever to, to help influence billions of dollars to move to more conscious behavior and more responsibility for, for the commons. We, we may not have a choice. We may be able to carry on this conversation about do I go conservative and do I not, or climate change and global poverty may catch up with us and the intersection of those two may really create a situation that we are not really thinking about right now very effectively. So, I, 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 and, and I happen to be a believer that um, the chances are not great that we're going to carry on this current comfortable lifestyle that a small percentage of us on the planet have and continue accelerating our wealth accumulation. However, I, I, I don't know, I'm not smart enough to know. But I'm going to spend the rest of my time working with the RSFs and play bigs and uh, offering advice and support and creating models, continuing to create models. Renewal 2 will raise another fund and, and we, we need in Canada to prove that that can be done so there's credibility and serious uh, financial advisors will get into these fields. So I'm going to be involved in models and uh, support the organizations that are taking risks and being pioneers and the people. Thank you both so much. Thanks to SOCAP for providing the environment for this. I will also say, you know, we've talked about Play Big a bunch. I have a little flyer if anyone's interested in learning more about that. And thanks to all of you for joining us. <laughs>